everyone, in this lecture we're going to be talking about the Z-Test, which is probably the most important topic in this entire course. So let's get started. So before we get started, I want to show you what you're probably going to find online if you try to look this up. And it's not very pretty. This is the Wikipedia response for what is a Z-Test. A z-test is any statistical test for which the distribution of the test statistics under the null hypothesis can be approximated by the normal distribution and by the central limit theorem, many statistics are approximately normally distributed by large samples. If t is a statistic that is approximately normally distributed under the null hypothesis, the next step in performing a z-test is to estimate the expected value of t under the null hypothesis and then obtain an estimate, s, of the standard deviation of t, after which the score, standard score is calculated from which one-tailed and two-tailed Whoa, slow down, there's an overwhelming amount of information in that. Frankly, when you look up Z-Test in any website, you're probably going to find something similar to that though. There's just a lot of information to talk about and unfortunately this has caused a lot of unease in students who take statistics courses. So the purpose of this video is to approach Z-Test in a totally new way, in a way that you've probably never seen before. Now, I do want to warn you that we're not going to go over 20 steps on how to conduct a z-test. Instead, we're going to approach z-tests in a more conceptual manner. And in fact, we're going to use confidence intervals to understand these things. Now, there is something else I want to mention before we move on to this conceptual understanding of z-tests. Z-tests are actually not very effective. We're actually building up to a bigger concept called the t-test. But in order to understand that, we first need to understand z-tests. Now this is the underlying question of this lecture. What makes a hypothesis believable? Now remember, there are hypotheses and there are theories. Theories are considered the best possible explanations of why something happened according to the scientific community. And a hypothesis is very similar to that, but it's not really considered a theory because it's not the best possible explanation for the entire scientific community. So really what this question is asking is, what makes a hypothesis convincing to the entire scientific community, or at least a large portion of that? And in this lecture, we're going to be addressing how to answer this question. So we're going to run through a hypothetical here. Suppose Apple claims that the average age of their users is 23. Now suppose I gather 1,000 Apple users, and I calculate that the average age of those 1,000 users is actually 26. Now let's stop and think about this for a second. Apple is claiming that the average age of their user is 23, and I just found that the average age of 1,000 Apple users is 26. 23 and 26. Are those numbers close? I mean, what does close mean? Now we actually have a mathematical way of determining whether or not two numbers are close together. And the answer is through confidence intervals. I can use confidence intervals to determine whether or not my 26 is close to 23. Now let me summarize that information that I just gave you. What I just basically said was that there's an 80% chance that Apple is wrong about their claim. But does that mean that Apple is wrong? That is actually a really important point to be said here. Just because there is an 80% probability that Apple is wrong, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a 100% chance that Apple is wrong about their claim. Now that hypothetical is actually really important for understanding what a z-test is. So now I'm going to be introducing you some terminology, and I believe this is the only terminology that we're going to be covering today. It's called the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is basically the original claim. That is Apple's claim. Apple was the one who originally came out with this idea that the average age of their users was 23. So we would consider that claim to be the null hypothesis. Now this is actually a norm that the scientific community generally accepts. In order for a null hypothesis to be rejected, someone has to be 95% certain that that null hypothesis is false. Now I'm going to rephrase what I just said but using confidence intervals. In order for a null hypothesis to be rejected, you actually have to build a 95% confidence interval that does not contain the claim. Now let's go back to our hypothetical. If you want to prove that Apple is wrong, you need to be at least 95% confident that Apple's claim is not correct. 
Otherwise, your sample could just be inconvenient. Now this next question is actually a question that a lot of my students ask me, and it's a really good question. Why 95%? That kind of seems like an arbitrary number, right? So why 95%? On a serious note, 95% was an arbitrary number that scientists felt really good about in the early 20th century. Because science! Now let's finally address what a z-test is. Now here's how this works. Whenever you're presented with a claim about what an average is, you might want to conduct a z-test to say, I'm a little skeptical about that claim. So whenever someone is skeptical of a claim, what they can do is they can conduct a z-test, which basically means that they're going to construct a 95% confidence interval. Now if that 95% confidence interval does not include the claim or the null hypothesis, then we should reject that null hypothesis. Otherwise, your experiment kind of sucks. Now let me break this down even further. If you're ever skeptical of some scientific claim, then you can just conduct your own study, gather your own statistic, maybe calculate your own average, and then say, hey, look, my average is different from what these scientists are saying. Okay, well, just because they're different doesn't necessarily mean the scientist is wrong. So you conduct a z-test and say, hey, look, I computed a 95% confidence interval, and now I'm 95% confident that the scientists are wrong. And in that scenario, scientists start saying, hmm, that looks believable now. Now to me, this definition is coherent. It makes sense. You're just trying to determine whether or not someone's likely wrong by showing that they're at least 95% wrong. And so whenever I want to go up to a scientist and say they're wrong, I just have to go up to them and say, well, there's like a 95% chance that you're wrong. Now I want to address some of these phrases that I've used in the definition of a z-test. What does it mean to reject a null hypothesis? Well, basically, that means that you go up to the scientist and you say, hey, I believe that this claim, this null hypothesis, is wrong. Well, I'm 95% certain that it's wrong. It could be right, but I'm 95% certain that it's wrong. And so scientists in the scientific community, they gather together and they look at your work and they say, Okay, I like what you did here. I, I, I think 95% certain is certain enough. And therefore, we're going to pretend this null hypothesis is no longer true, and we're going to accept your theory instead. And that's actually how it works in the scientific community. Now, I also want to address some of that harsh vocabulary that I used earlier. What does it mean for an experiment to suck? Well, basically, when you find that your number, that average that you calculate, is actually close to the null hypothesis. Basically, your 95% confidence interval does contain the null hypothesis. Or, in other words, your results are not statistically significant. You can't go to the scientists and say, yeah, there's a 95% probability that they're wrong. You can't say that anymore because that's not true. And because you don't reach that bar in the scientific community, basically your experiment is kind of worthless in that sense. And believe me, that feels terrible because in general, experiments take time, they take lots of efforts, they cost a lot of money, and then to go through all of that and realize that your experiment is not worth it, that really sucks. Now there's going to be this lingering question throughout the next several lectures. Earlier I mentioned that z-tests are not really effective. So why are z-tests dumb? Now here's a hint as to why z-tests are ineffective. Remember earlier when I mentioned that I did some math and constructed an 80% confidence interval? How did I do that? I mean, I sampled 1,000 Apple users and calculated this age and calculated this confidence interval. How did I create that confidence interval? Now we'll actually address those questions in the next couple lectures, but I also want to foreshadow something else. So far, z-tests are really only useful for debunking theories that make claim about averages. So what about like proportions? Anyways, those questions will all be addressed in the upcoming lectures. So I'll see you guys then. You just watched a video from Amore Learning. We provide free math videos and we offer many online courses. We also provide free math tutoring via YouTube Live every Thursday and Sunday at 9 p.m. Eastern Time.
Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like this video to get access to all of our free content. And put a comment in the comment section if you have any math questions. Check out all of our courses on amorelearning.org.